good evening and welcome to the 316th meeting of the New York Comics and Picture Story Symposium. This is a weekly lecture series on comics, illustration, animation, now toys, and the history of text image work. The series is sponsored in part by the Will and Ann Eisner Family Foundation. Our guest tonight is Aaron Rossner. Uh, Aaron Rossner works with various media on paper and creates small sculptures from wood, metal, and plastic. His work has been shown in Victoria, Vancouver, and Toronto, Canada. Uh, he'll, he's had a, a, a fascination with old time production processes and um, experiments with mold and dye making, pewter casting, and plastic injection molding. He is in the process of starting a small business called Wingnut Toys, through which he'll produce limited runs of his own toy designs. And he's speaking to us tonight from uh, Victoria, British Columbia. And I think I, I discovered him about a year ago, the cartoonist Mark Bell did a talk about some of his favorite artists and Aaron was one of them. So uh, his talk tonight is entitled The Draw of Novelties and Oddball Toys. So take it away, Aaron. Well, thanks very much, Ben. And uh, I also want, wanted to say thanks to Mark Bell for showing some of my work in the past. Um, so I just wrote out my, my little intro talk. It's still really fresh, so I, I'll just read it off the paper here. Uh, I've been into toys like many people since I was very young. That makes sense. Uh, I received my father's dinky toys when I was a kid. He came from England, so I got his 1950s uh, die cast dinky toys. And that along with secondhand store gifts from my grandmother, such as Meccano and other building sets really got me started. Actually, uh, yeah, my grandma bought me one of these used, it's from the sixties, but I loved it. It was one of my favorite toys ever that Meccano, any kind of building construction set. Uh, was, well, they were my favorites. Uh, these are some of the toys that I got from my dad. And I had a bunch more, uh, but they were all military ones, all that military green tanks and guns. And I just didn't care about those, so I sold them. Um, yeah, well, I've always loved the building sets. I didn't have a full appreciation for the those dinky toys and Lesney early matchbox toys uh, until my buddy Keith Jones came over. He always seemed to know before me about all sorts of things, collector, collectible wise. He said they were actually worth money and uh, adults were paying, yeah, adults were buying these old toys and I found that fascinating. I wondered why, because I, I've been playing with Hot Wheels and you could just go like that and you run across the room and so smooth, whereas the Lesney toys would barely go across the table. But uh, over the years, I uh, after that, I, I thought, wow, well, why, why are these collectible? And, and I just, it was like an acquired taste, and I got from there, along with going to secondhand stores with my grandma, I got really into those and, and other old toys and things. Uh, yeah, so that interest further, yeah, second, anyway. Uh, then in December of 1999, I remember that, that time, uh, Christmas, 
99. I was visiting my pal, Michael Dirksen. He's a, an artist friend. I used to go over to his house after school because he lived right across from our high school. And we'd watch TV and draw and read comic books. He, he always had more comic books than I did. So I'd borrow them and read them. Anyway, he introduced me in 99 to eBay. He said, you've got to sign up for this. Check this out. And I, I don't know how many listings were up in 99. I'm sure still millions, but um, that really got me started. Like so many millions of people, eBay was a huge source of uh, inspiration and, and just research. Like. I would research toys and buy them if I could afford them. But I'd find so many others and I'd take photos of them. Or, I mean, I'd, I'd uh, save the images. And preparing for this talk, I found actually some of those old images and they're just too crummy to use. I actually used some of them so I couldn't find other examples of some of these toys. But, um, yeah, that's how <clears throat> old they were taken on the earliest um, digital consumer digital cameras, I guess. Um, oh, another thing is my grandfather, he died way back in 85. So I was pretty young then. But uh, this is one of his model engineer magazines. He had a, a small workshop and I, I have some vague memories of it but um i got this years after he died and and so it's one of my favorite little little old books booklets and it turns out this lathe on the back is like that was the first lathe i ended up buying from my uncle because he had a machine shop in town here so that was that's kind of cool i thought uh, oh yeah, and I started going to toy shows uh, 20 years, 25 years ago with my grandma and I met this guy, Brian Lilly, who uh, goes, he, he goes by the, the uh, name The Toy Man, Brian Lilly, The Toy Man. And um, this is about 10 years ago. He's very much into Meccano. He would go around, he doesn't use the internet still. Um, all the sales are through the phone and he, he gets huge estate sales of mechano toys. People just know him in Western Canada. And so he's always, he always has stuff to sell and he always has money to buy and he drives around in his truck and, and loads it up. Um, yeah, so of course, because of the, the virus -y times right now, um, I haven't seen him in a couple of years and I hope he's doing all right. Um, there's one other thing I was gonna show here. I don't know, I can't remember. So um, I'll just, I'll go right into my little toy video. I cut it into four sections. Um, so tin toys I've always found to be very beautiful. Buildings, I started with buildings because to me the, the basic, the most interesting toys have always been buildings and, and cars. I think because that's something in real life, but uh, it, it's just like not basic needs. The house pretty much is, but um, the iconic house has always interested me and, and the way it can be represented in, in toy form uh, and with all this beautiful offset lithography printing on the, on the tin plate, it's, yeah, it's, I've always liked this sort of thing. So I thought I'd 
start with that. I have a, a version of this. It's a windmill made by Bing, and it was made to work with uh, steam engines. Uh, I have one back here that's not really not working yet. I need a, a burner for it. Anyway, um, I just I love the the detail, the bricks here, the mossy kind of surface all all printed, printed on, and the, the way the, uh, just, the, I love the manufacturing process, thinking about the dyes they had to use to, to press out these parts and, and roll after cutting, rolling them out. Yeah, it's fascinating to me. This is a, a little, train station piece that I picked up at a, uh, a toy show locally a few years ago. And I think people who are into comics appreci would appreciate this sort of thing because it looks like a comic scene to me. And um, I, I have a lot of examples of these in this talk. Um, just fronts of buildings and stuff with really neat uh, advertisements and <clears throat> things like that. Now, I don't know who that character was strolling out of the film. Uh, Hansel and Gretel, that's always interesting to me. I particularly like on this one, this funny scene on the side here, like um, maybe they escaped. Oh yeah, they did escape after they pushed her in the, the oven, right? But it's a neat scene with the woods and the moon on the house. Um, Marx, this is made by Louis Marx and Co. I, I can't remember, maybe they're from New York. Anyway, they made so many toys for like over decades. Many of my favorite tin toys were made by Louis Marx. And I just, I, I really like these little, these little scenes, store scenes. What I love about this one is just this blue sky you can see through the bank of windows up here. It's, it's just little details like that that are the colors, you know, the details and colors are really nice. Yeah, same with this. <clears throat> this is uh, this is a beautiful piece you'll see in the next slide. Uh, it closes up. It's like a portable kids <laughs> grocery store. Uh, but this is beautiful, I think. Uh, I actually wanted to use this or redraw, make my own version of this and use it for a, like an animation backdrop or even a green screen backdrop for a live action scene. It's just everything about it's perfect to me. I bought these recently I got some of the whole formed ones and then in a separate lot these really cool uh, die cut pieces that were never uh, never folded up they're candy containers made in 1914 and um, the company is called West Brothers I don't know if they made the candy or just the containers but 
the uh, detail on some of these, the little, um, we'll see in a second here. I mean, it's not the greatest detail ever, but it's, I like this too, just the simple, almost, yeah, it's, it's all dotted. It's, um, what do you call that process in the early, uh, well, I guess they still use it for printing comics, but you know, when you look close, you can see all the little dots. Maybe that is offset and solid. I really like the, the cinema in the garage. Yeah, so I found this article on candycontainer.org. It turns out that, well, you, you don't want to read this whole thing, but um, these were a bunch of these, the flats were stored away for years and years, just found in an old warehouse and made available again recently, or since this came out in the 80s, maybe 90s. Um, and it's interesting, they're still being sold on eBay in flats. I got six or, six or eight in one lot. And they're definitely old because they have some rust and weird machine oil marks on them and stuff. This must be a famous um, Ferris wheel and that face. I've seen it around for years, examples of it. And I just think it's it's really cool. I I don't have one. A lot of these toys I don't have examples of yet. Um, but it's nice. This, if I had the money, this is the toy I, the building toy I'd get right now. But they're like five hundred. They're like probably a thousand bucks for a really nice one on eBay right now and elsewhere. But I, I think it's gorgeous, just all the different kinds of patterns and details everywhere. Oh, and it has, uh, on the side, it has all these, these uh, push buttons like a typewriter. And each one does a different thing, opens the front door so the witch lady comes out or the, Looks like the skeleton pops out of the chimney, and I think cats. Oh yeah, the cat pops up. All sorts of stuff, and that's made by Louis Marks and Co. as well. So this is a a more worn down example, but I think it looks even better. Uh, now I'm I'm going into wooden toys. This is just. This is like a $10,000 model, uh, one of a kind piece. I can't remember how big it is, but I've been watching that for a year or so on, on eBay. Just, I don't know, I just, I'm curious if anyone's ever gonna buy it, but it's uh, incredible. I mean, nowadays people with their giant 3D printers could do something like that, but you know, just seeing all the, the marks from the, the wood chisel and other tools make it stand out as a really neat piece. This is a, a castle that I've got. It comes apart, uh, all the pieces store in the bottom. I love it. I want to make castles like this myself. Eventually, I'll try. Um, but this is from Germany and 1950s, I think. Oh yeah, this is some more photos of it from the cellar. And, uh, I bought this from a woman in Ontario through eBay a couple of years ago. And she has tons of Erzgebirge. I don't know if that's the right pronunciation, but Erzgebirge was 
or is a town in Germany where they made a lot of folk, wooden folk toys and they're, they're awesome. This is a French toy. I think part of it's pewter or lead. Yeah, like all the figures would be lead and, and the uh, structure here. And uh, it's just full scenes like that are amazing, I think, just to get that in a box. And they're all, you know, they're all strapped into the box so it could be shipped as a finished product. Wow, it's, it's really nice. This sort of thing really inspires me. Not that I've made anything that like in that realm yet, really, but oh, that was uh, something else nice. Uh, these are Erzgebirge toys. You can see from the nickel quarter uh, how big that is. I really wanted this, but I think I'll just make my own version of a little wood shop. Yeah, I don't have room for more toys anyway. Uh, I think this is an Erzgebirge. This is, it's rare, I think. Yeah, you can see, it's rare to see packaging for these. And I like how rough some of these are. You know, they're kind of crudely made um, folk toys to begin with, but then they, <clears throat> the paint cracks and they get covered in dust and they look ancient. This I put in here just because I like the, again, looking at the manufacturing process. Or, or more so the painting process, just using stencils. It's really simple, but um, effective. There are a lot of these little um, tiny like, matchbox size building kits. Oh, I'll show a few more later. I just put these in here because I like all the different styles used for, for the packaging. Again, the beautiful colors. And it's also interesting how some of these manufacturers are going for realism and then others show people living in these structures as if they're the toys themselves blown up. So it's, it's really interesting. And this to me is just gorgeous, the, the multi-color print here. There's another way that uh, you could buy block toys. I think that's German. This, I think that's Spanish. Again, just uh, an incredible illustration to me. Yeah, more, more of these kind of kits. Build with me. <laughs> oh, I have a set of these. Um, Tom Thumb Toy Town. It's pretty, pretty great. Uh, these are in a Japanese museum. And I think, yeah, spray painted through stencils again. Just really inspirational to me. I, I like thinking about different ways to for color on wood. <clears throat> um, this, I have some of this stuff. It's uh, pretty crazy, hard to build with. 
uh, Wenebrick, I think is how you say it, um, difficult. It, it doesn't want to line up properly, but it looks really cool once it's built. I have one down in the living room. I like, I also like how uh, this and that previous Bayco, how there are girls or women that pops in on the packaging as well. Yeah, it's cool. It's not just all guys here again. I had a set of these. It's uh, it's really interesting. It's very far away from Lego. It's actual bricks, tiny bricks, and they come with a cement in a bag, I think. And you, it's a fake cement that you can dissolve with water, or a, a less strong cement. But uh, <laughs> I never did use it that way. I just kind of use them for rubble or something like that for, for photos. For like miniature photos. So then, yeah, I don't know which one came first, but um, I've never seen one of these. And I've never had one of these. These are really cool. Anything that you receive flat that you can construct yourself is pretty interesting, I think. And a lot of these have really interesting names or just cool names, stand loads. Like, what does that mean? It's neat. Yeah, uh, this went through a lot, but it's, it still has a, a weird, I have an interesting charm about it. <clears throat> Kids with tools. I like how the kid is working on something else and the toys are behind him. Yeah, anything factory related, including old, like old train sets, or, or any scale that has the, the train buildings. Uh, I don't have room for that. Like, I don't have people in my interest, but this is really neat. And back around to uh, German, I think maybe Japanese. Just simple, uh, attractive little houses. So Lego made uh, these weird building bricks at one point. I think it's in the early 60s. And they also made wooden cars and trucks and stuff up until 1960. And I show a few of those later. I thought I uh, might enjoy this writing from the, I don't know, 30s or 40s, a little comic character. This is uh, more really early, like the standard kind of Lego brick look, but I really love the marbled colors. Uh, it's just something about marbling. I think you're letting nature 
influence your creation to some degree. And that's just really interesting to me. And I'll show some more marble items later. Uh, these are the cast iron banks that are, they're in the KID, K-I-D-D -D, Toy Museum in Portland. I went to 12 or 13 years ago. And yeah, I guess, I don't know, they were server people. But most of these banks are totally out of my range. Like, here are a bunch more there. I guess you can get some of them for 50 bucks, but many of these would be quite uh, hard to find, expensive. And uh, these are German flats, as they're called. They're um, just flat tin or uh, pewter lead castings. They would carve, they'd get a flat chunk of slate, uh, two sides to make a two-part mold and engrave by hand this, these images in reverse. And I got really into that myself. I didn't know it was called that there, there was a thing out there already. I, I just started carving in plaster. Actually, I saw people uh, at a medieval reenactment society here 20 years ago or something, 25 years ago. They were casting lead in soapstone molds that they hand carved. They're making <clears throat> like belts, hooks, and stuff like that. That's how I first became interested in pewter casting. And even though these are flat, they're uh, and very delicate, they're they're great. I mean, I'd love to have. I don't have any of these items. So that's the end of that section. Now, uh, this is. I started with just cars that are interesting for different reasons and then got into cars that have interesting characters in them, whether they be animal or human or some other, a robot. Uh, it's just a beautiful display. There's so many penny toys out there, little tin penny toys, and they're getting to be <clears throat> worth a lot more now. I just have a couple of examples here just, just for the heck of it. This one's really not solid shape. So at the, for me, the high end of, of like automobile toys, it would be something like this made in Germany. How we say that, Geisha. Uh, these beautiful kits, every component's in there. Uh, looks like it has actual uh, light bulbs in it. The motor turns and they, they light up. It's just amazing. That's a very small uh, German Viking. Car. Marklin and Meccano made these, these very precise models, uh, clockwork cars. Um, this isn't really an oddball toy at all, but uh, I also just wanted to put in some unique ones that are very, uh, to me, kind of like high end in, in my mind, just to, the craftsmanship. I wanted to put some examples like that in here. Here's a Meccano one with uh, it's like a working shifter or transmission and other stuff. This is a kit that I got not so long ago. I just wanted to see what a, an old commercial casting kit would be like. It came with a casting compound 
but um, or molding the powder there. But I have I just use plaster of Paris because I don't know what's in there. You know, you never know. Uh, and the molds are really crude. It's a thin rubber mold, but it's full of defects. It's it's interesting. I thought because it's from the fifties that it would be smoother, but they're uh, they're manufactured like that. The original models must have been uh, so so. Here's an actual uh, toy die, midge toy, uh, steel, one-sided steel die for die casting. And then here are some of the, the examples. Not a, not my favorite looking toy, but I, I really like seeing um, production equipment, tools like that. Here's another one. This one's in the Kid Toy Museum again. And these are, oops, uh, Auburn rubber, I think. These examples here. So very, very simple, but it's interesting. It seems unique to me, that thick of a plywood just cut into a simple shape. These are in a Japanese toy museum somewhere, and I just like the stenciled uh, lettering. This is a Lego car. Another name I think was Dansk, D-A-N-S-K-U. And just weird looking, weirdly shaped vehicles are really interesting. I, I like having stuff like this around. It's just funny thinking about, well, especially because that looked like a one-off, like thinking about someone making this weird car for, uh, for a son or daughter or whatever. Um, here's a marble, yeah. Here's what I was talking about. This is a really weird car, obviously. It looks like a shoe to me. Um, and it's it's so crudely, you can see the wheels are bending. It could have been like that right from the get-go. Uh, who knows? Some of these toys really do warp over time quite a bit. So maybe that's what happened. But also, look how it's been how the axes have been put in, they're just posts with slots in them and then melted over. So it's, for me, it's cool to see that sort of thing, just to see the most basic uh, method for uh, making a, a car roll. Another weird looking car that might be, a, it almost looks like a CO2, um, what do you call it? CO2 eraser. I really love this. It's just perfect shape, I think. Uh, I've seen another one, only one other one that was red with black lettering. Um, yeah. Just the simplicity is key with some of these. Uh, another Marx toy. Marx has a really interesting logo. I can show some logos later. It's just like a railroad crossing. But yeah, they made some pretty bizarre toys. Like look at this, the way this guy is holding the steering wheel. <clears throat> That's not attached to anything but himself. And the Pinocchio car with the it's big steering wheel too.
this is a flat, I think it's a paperboard advertising car. Uh, like the actual car body is just like a flat car. And I guess, yeah, the wheels are metal, but just a really interesting piece. This is just funny to me, a funny the expression on the driver with those goggles and, and the streaks of color on the car. I love race car toys quite a bit. This is also interesting. It seems like a one of a kind toy, except the wheels look, well, they're manufactured, but they could have come in a kit or something. Getting into more character toys. I have one of these. It's uh, a Ted toy. And uh, it makes a little clinking sound when you pull it because there's a spur gear at the back and a uh, little strip of metal. So it goes clink, 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 clink. I like it. I think it's, it looks like a fishing maneuver. And I love the wheels. On it. I guess the idea here is to blow through these, through some tubes, and then uh, these cars roll around something. I, I don't know if it comes with a track or not, but an interesting idea. And I love the cloud with these bubble ray things coming out. Nosco made several of these really <clears throat> interesting hot rod cars um, with visible engines and the pistons go up and down. And I'd really like to have one of these. This is one of those toys that warps a lot over time pretty badly from what I've seen. Like the majority of these won't even roll straight anymore for some reason. I guess it's plastic is uh, too thin. That could be part of it. Another Nosco. And I like how this clown figure is reading music, but it's just like a Nosco plastics pattern. It's a monkey overlooking. A lot of these I I like just for the packaging, the funny wording on the, I mean, that's not all that funny, but uh, it's interesting. I'd probably rather have that box than the car. And that's a, I think that's a thing. So. I mean, a lot of these, maybe a bunch of you already know about, you know, I'm sure. Uh, so Louis Marx again, this model here, they seem to make a whole bunch of different uh, character cars using this base, base uh, model, the big wheel on the back, small one on a pivot at the front. Uh, Yeah, here's another one. The wheels might be a bit different, but it, the, the shape's basically the same. Uh, I wonder if they use the same dies for stamping. I, I'm sure they did for some of these. But I'd never seen this one until recently. It's neat to see a different character after a while, I think. It's, uh, Oh, who knows? There must be a book out there on these. Very comical figures. This one looks similar, but I think it was put out by Strauss. It's a toy company. 
called Strauss. And they're a little higher end even than the, the Marx toys. And I really like this, this weird, like it must have been fun to have been an artist uh, working on these toys. Did, like how long did it take to do that, to design that? Probably not very long at all. And then the rest is done by machinery and it looks like a really cool uh, object afterwards. This is one that I picked up, um, made in Japan, a pole toy. And uh, the rabbit's missing its ears, of course, but uh, when you pull it, that bird pops its head out. And uh, I think the rabbit, bob yeah, bobs up and down <laughs> alternately. So it's, um, it's pretty neat. I love this sort of thing. A simple mechanism inside, just a cam, a couple of cams to lift uh, the, the heads. But um, yeah, simple. Again, I like the simple toys and the stenciled work here. Uh, this, it's interesting that this is a Japanese toy. I realized later, uh, I'll be showing some Kobe toys from Kobe, Japan region. Um, they also have popping up bits. Most often though, they're eyeballs that pop straight out or tongues or both. There's an interesting story that goes along with that. So this is, so nice. To me, for a simple block wood toy, with a few extra bits, uh, this is just, this is a perfect example of like how well you can do. And look who's coming up behind them. Tricks. So I guess Tricks followed Felix. This is made by a company called uh, the Gong Bell Company, Gong Bell Manufacturing or something. So I, I bet this makes some noise as you play it along. Their, their logo is a bell, like a big bell shape. <clears throat> uh, this, that was made by Hustler. There are a few toy companies that I, I really like to follow. Um, Hustler, Ted Toys. I just, I like the idea here, uh, just how simple, like the horse body is just like a hot dog. And then wheels, the horse has wheels. It's just like a, such a weird, it looks great, but thinking about it, it's a weird thing. And this is a, obviously a really sad looking horse. It's a broken wind up mechanism. But just, I feel like it's worth keeping photos of these strange pieces just because they are unique now in their poor condition. Like they all weather differently. Whoopi Wagger is pretty funny, I think. Oh, it's a Fisher Price toy. And that other one is from India. And these, I just had to put in because they're funny. Simple, simple and funny. Blow molded vehicle. Looks great. I almost bought this, but <clears throat> on eBay, but in Canada anyway, it's 
really difficult to, I mean, the shipping costs now are totally crazy. Penny toys. <laughs> Craig Stan made a lot of uh, Japanese company. Well, here it says Hong Kong. Anyway, I know. Well, Craig Stan made uh, some robots, tin robots and stuff. And this is just um, really neat, I think. It's strange. A bit of wallpaper or something, moss. Here's a little video bit. I hope it's not too loud, but I'm showing a few of my uh, wind ups. And this is a really pathetic bird. Start croaking only if you turn it upside down. I think this is a 70s coffee I have. I might be wrong, but copy of a 50s or 60s original, but full fellows. Yeah, so on to um, some more creepy toys. Sad toys. Uh, I think this, I forgot the name of this donkey, but it, something weird happens with its eyes. Maybe they roll back into its head or something when you wind it up. <laughs> uh, I think that's a Czechoslovakian uh, simple mechanical toy. I like the creepy rabbits. Jonah and the Whale, that's in the Kid Toy Museum. These are, uh, if I could get a cast iron, old cast iron toy, I think this is from the 1890s. Well, this, this would be my ideal cast iron bank. It's just the iconic castle tower and this weird thug uh, monster giant in the top. Uh, I think it's amazing. And one of these actually sold recently at a, a Bertoya toy auction for 3,500 US. Uh, I like these all kinds of articulating or articulated uh, figures and bead toys, mostly because they have the beautiful paint jobs or aniline dyes. Just creepy. Another weird cat. Strange puppet. These are reminiscent of the Kobe toys that I'll be showing soon as well because of these popping out eyeballs. Uh, this is a tin toy that I have. It's supposed to blow smoke, I think, but <clears throat> right now only the eyeballs work. Nice cast iron bank. 
Uh, there are so many of these kind of uh, peg people toys. I'm trying to think of the word for that uh, ball and socket construction figures. I think they're really cool. And some comic lines. So you want to be a lion tamer. Well, this is a good place to start. And uh, cow hand, there are a bunch of these, a bunch of different ones. I don't own any, I don't really want to. I just think the packaging's fun. Twistums were uh, made in the 20s and they're, they're, they were a really high quality toy. Like they had piano wire inside holding them all together and you could twist them any which way you wanted. But they don't, they didn't age well. Like most of them look like this. Most of the ones I've seen, just whatever kind of paint they used, liked to flake off. This is a good example of a nice version of this right there. But that's pretty rare from what I've seen. And um, I think that's Myrna Loy, and I'm not sure who Virginia Lee Corbin is, but yeah, the Twistums had a lot of a lot of help getting seen out of them. I don't have any of those. I just have a poster on my wall, a reprint. I'd like to have a nice example, get a nice one someday. These are neat. Any of these weird figural puzzle toys I find pretty interesting. Uh, stacking, acrobatic, stacking, interlocking, like barrel of monkeys and that sort of thing, or when they actually click together, buildings around for a long time. And I think they're even remaking them now. This is a Kobe toy. And uh, that's me finding it before I purchased it. This is at an auction, a local auction here. And um, in a rough shape, but I, uh, I won the lot. And this is, it's not completely fixed up yet. It's missing some parts. Uh, and this isn't even glued together yet. I just propped it up like that for the photo. Um, I have a lot of toys that need a lot of work. I'm just, yeah, someday in the future I'll, I'll work on them. But uh, so these are made from the 1890s to 50s in that town of Kobe. And there are a few major makers. I'll show a couple more photos first. I think it's supposed to hammer down on that wooden pad thing that makes, would make a nice clogging sound. This is another interesting one with the eyeballs that pop out a dice shaker, uh, but it was so well made that, I mean, if there were no dice in there and it was screwed tight, you, you might not know that the, the top of the hat comes off at all. It's uh, about three inches tall, this figure. This is cool. Uh, my friend Seth Scriber was visiting town here and he saw these these Kobe toys and when he went back to Toronto he made a couple of his own he sent me this one it's, it's, it's nice to have for the collection 
uh, this is another one. I got it like this with all the, with the eyes and tongue missing, but that's fine. I, I think it's pretty ghostly looking. It's pretty eerie. And it, it's like the size of a, a tennis ball. It's just a beautiful little piece of carved wood. I, yeah, I can't remember what kind of wood it is. It's a high quality, very high, uh, like dense, dense wood. These are um, charms. I think they're celluloid, not Bakelite. Um, yeah, so I think it, they're highly flammable too. And you hold celluloid toys supposedly. If they catch fire, they're not going out. They're, they're just going up in flames. But they're so, they just use the same face over and over again. And then use some kind of solvent to glue them down. I like them a lot. So here's that magazine I picked up. It goes over some of the history. Uh, here's an old catalog. This was a different maker from, from the person who made mine. These are um, oh, Oda Tashira, maybe. But I believe this is. Uh, Dezaki, Fuso, Matsu, I believe that person made the one that I have because of these. There's certain things you can look for, like the way the, the shape of the wheels and the, the number of holes drilled in them, and, <clears throat> and especially in the face. Let's see if there's a better color. No. Well, uh, the way the, the areas around the eyes are carved out or kind of scooped out, and then the other areas carved out alongside the, the kind of the, or in the cheeks, just certain things you can look for because they, they made them for decades. They made them in the same way. Uh, these are some clay toys from India that I picked up at a Salvation Army in, in what? locally here a while back and um, I don't have a lot of figures like just three standing figures that that don't do anything but they're really interesting to me I love the, the paint jobs they have a lot of them are breaking apart they were like this when I got them just the clays flaking away from the, the leg posts. But that just adds to their charm for me. They're not all, obviously, they're, most of them are OK. Uh, Charlie Chaplin brass mold. I just thought that might be interesting. That would be for lead casting. And a uh, rubber doll's head mold. I think it was my friend Michael Dirksen who told me that rather than forming on the outside of, of the master like that, they would blow or pour rubber or something onto the inside and then unravel the head, like turn it inside out, and then you'd have a your copy of the, um, <clears throat> of the original of the model. More from the Kid Toy Museum. A penny toy. Uh, I just saw these the other day uh, at my friend Tim's house. So he's a garbage garbage man. Well, I mean, uh, he drives a big 
bin truck and goes to estates, like he gets called in to clear out houses and stuff. When people die or they're moving away and the parents don't want, or the, the kids don't want any of the stuff the parents left in there or, or whatever, like decades worth of amazing stuff just gets chucked into these bins. And he's found, he told me he's found all kinds of neat stuff and he, uh, lots of toys and he just put these out on his in his shelf the other day but there the story with these is uh louis marx and co commissioned this company in mexico to make the molds for these and then i guess marx never paid for them for these dyes so these guys in mexico took the took the molds back home and made them themselves and they changed the name to Plastimarks of Mexico. German clicker toy, I think. Is that Churchill? Or somebody else? I really like, I like lots of different toys, obviously, but uh, mechanical toys like this are super inspirational. I'd love to make something like this myself. I, I like, I don't have this one. And another interesting thing from that era is just all the caves, kitty campers. There's also the comical cop, and crazy cat, and uh, I'm sure a bunch of others. Sunny Andy. <laughs> I got this a while ago. It's uh, a box kit that's, it's, well, it was inspired by Mr. Potato Head. It came out a year or two after. I think Mr. Potato Head came out in 52. This came out in maybe 54. But what a great uh, take on Mr. Potato Head. It's like just take an orange or whatever, and then the rest is provided in here. Uh, yeah. So it comes with this styrofoam piece. and. Uh, supposed to put any old vegetable or fruit in its place. Pretty darn cool, I think. Various Felix toys. Oh, these those are the birds I have again. And, uh, the butterflies made by Alps in Japan, more beautiful lithography work on that. But it's that's inspired by a German, an old German toy. And I think this this version is more colorful than the original, actually. This, I know I keep saying. I love this, it's the most amazing thing ever, but with this piece, truly, uh, it, it's totally amazing to me. Like, you know, you get these camera tripods these days, the gorilla pods with the ball and socket joints, and they fall apart, uh, mine did anyway, pretty quickly. This just looks so robust, and I love how it looks like the tin man and yet he's got this composition head or clay head and hands. It's made in Switzerland. And um, I saw this one online several years ago and it was really expensive, just out of my price range. Uh, but I hope to be able to get one someday. There are a couple on eBay right now. 
but they're not, it's not the same figure and uh, the face isn't as interesting. More jointed wood. Uh -huh. Belt and composition, I think. More. I'm pretty sure these are German Erzgebirge toys again. I just love the simple scene in each case here. Like there's so much expression in this fox's face. There's a lot of tension. There's a story, a good story in each of these. I just had to put this in here because it, it, to me, it's really beautiful box. I think that's the end of that section. Yeah. Uh, this is the last piece. Oh, I'll just go back for a second. So that, I don't know if any of you recognize that from, I mean, if you're into ancient history programs and stuff like that. Anyway, uh, it's ancient Egyptians, uh, Senate, I think, game. It looks like crib. Is it cribbage or crib? Anyway. Uh, Ancient, ancient game that was found in a tomb. I think actually this is one of a couple that were found in Tutankhamun's Commons tomb. And it's just fascinating to look at, to look at ancient toys and games. Seen a variety of these, they're really inspiring. Could do all sorts of things with that, that chain drawing thing. Uh, this is like an, an early spirograph. And I've noticed doing some research that uh, there were a bunch of different patents, a bunch of different versions. This might be the earliest. I have um, one called a Hootenanny. It's around here somewhere. It might be downstairs. So very similar. This is, I think, oh yeah, the spinning top that you see here, it goes along the perimeter and the interior of this uh, structure here somehow, which is really interesting science story. This is just really funny and uh, colorful. To me, it looks like a this messed up pizza cutting job here or something. Yeah, dinner is served. Actually, this is my buddy Michael Dirksen's work. That other thing made me uh, remember his his work. He makes these giant globes, spheres. They're about a foot and a half in diameter out of different layers of um, colored plaster. And then he sands them down afterwards with an orbital sander and all the, you know, because it's never going to be perfect, it allows different pockets to open up and different layers get exposed. And uh, they're really beautiful, I think. I have one in the kitchen. I think I have this one back here. Anyway, 
he's still making noises. He makes them on and off, um, or he has been over the years. I just like the expression. <laughs> well, the robot figure is really cool, but also just the expressions on a lot of these old uh, games. <clears throat> For me, uh, it's just interesting how, you know, they say it's obvious packaging really helps sell things, but in this case, it's like the packaging is all it's completely interlinked with the item, and it just, it's like you need both to make this a finished thing. If you take the train out, it's going to look really crappy by itself. And same with, uh, with the packaging, just having all the holes there. It's just interesting. So um, yeah, something I like to think about. Just a funny, funny sound game. Uh, I have this up on my wall outside my room here. It's just so simple. I love the black. Black, white, simple colors. I guess that's Dutch. I think it is. And this is out there on the wall as well. A little sun bleached, but oh well. Uh, I haven't played this yet, but great characters, great graphics. It's always neat to see these old games, just to see how simple they are. Just a printed board and it must be one big like die platen with all the, the uh, hole punches on it. Just one row, it's all, it's all done. Another yeah, these old there are so many. I didn't have time to compile all the uh, other kits and things. I'm sure there's enough material here, but there were tons of like kids art kits and things like this put out over the 50s and 60s. I love anything to do with molding, uh, mold making, die making, and uh, making multiples through casting. Even like this is really neat just uh, Press molding. I'm getting into a few. I don't have a ton of novelties on on here. Just a few uh, like gumball machine things and these odd, weird bits. I uh, didn't realize I had it until that guy I was talking about, Brian Lilly. Um, the old guy at the toy show uh, until he came over a couple of years ago and saw in my basement a couple of these these crane toys with extra mechanisms below them. He's like, those are actually used in these kind of uh, these whatever you call them machines, like toy vending machines. And I forgot. I don't know what you call these. But um, so I have these bare bone mechanical bases attached to uh, the crane. And even the buckets have been made uh, separately, like they're reinforced steel. And they're really, really interesting. 
the mechanisms are kind of gummed up, but there's another project for the future. This, this is just funny. Visit your zoo often, key to the zoo. And from what I've seen, they um, like it might say Chicago Zoo or you know, different city zoos. I'm going to change the diet a little bit. These are a couple of gumbo machine toys that I had novelty things. Um, I just put the dog in there to show how weird this one is compared to a, one of these typical ones. I don't know what, maybe this was put together wrong. Or maybe it's like a, some weird frogman swimmer figure. I've had it for probably a decade. And it's just been on my shelf. And, and I actually haven't tried to take it apart and reassemble it. I, I think it's kind of funny just to keep it Maybe that is how it's supposed to be. It's just odd. I used to have some of these. I like any, any of these kind of toys that are come in component, uh, separate parts, and it's like a tiny puzzle you have to put together. I have some of these, but I, they're packed away. These are really interesting. Um, various margarine, <clears throat> margarine factories in Germany during the 50s and 60s, I think. Like Wagner, I guess, is how you'd say one of the names. Uh, Free Helma. And there are at least a couple more. These companies commissioned to make this to make these uh, all these figures and there are tons and tons of different ones, all in white plastic. I'm guessing so that people can paint them themselves. But yeah, so this used to be a margarine premium in Germany, which is pretty neat. I, I have a book. Like uh, it's in German, I can't understand it, but it shows photos of hundreds and hundreds of different ones. And a lot of the companies copy each other almost exactly. You can tell they're different molds, but uh, there is a lot of copying going on, which is interesting. I love the, these industrial ones. And however you say that, Strupo Peter, the, I mean, his fingers have broken off, but it's like uh, the Edward Scissorhands figure, or the, probably the inspiration for Edward Scissorhands. Uh, these are cereal premiums, and uh, I tried to buy some years ago, and like a decade ago, they were already really expensive. I guess they're kind of rare, but really cool. Just simple mechanism. Forgot what they're actually called or which, which uh, cereal had them. But good old drinking Lucky Bird. And this isn't mine. I just thought it was a funny thing getting close to Halloween, so showing a few uh, yeah, Halloween novels. And so I got this years ago as well, and it's super inspiring to me. Uh, it's, I love miniatures and little plastic items that are at least maybe not fully mass produced, maybe they're short run pieces, but there are many multiples of them. Uh, yeah, and these catalogs are getting harder to find. I mean, mine's not colorful, like there's some pretty amazing novelty catalogs out there. Uh, 
it's cool to see this plastic injection molding machine. I don't know what, which one that is, what company made it, but this is, this is the kind of stuff I love to see, just like booklets like this with examples of <clears throat> little things that can be made. Few of the pages and stuff. And uh, it was in New York in West 45th, so probably long gone. Oh, there's so many of these um, dexterity puzzles, ball, ball rolling puzzles. I only put in a few here. Because um, there's just, it's overwhelming trying to look through them all. But um, this one I have, I really like it. Made in Germany. I guess you're supposed to shake the mice into the coal scuttle thing, and then it goes underneath. I mean, I, I know that's how it works, but it's just a weird idea. And sometimes it gets stuck in there. Yeah, interesting. And the graphics are beautiful. Kind of a Halloween -y one. I think this is the last, this might be the last one. Uh, I put this in because it's a prototype, which is amazing to me. It looks like a watercolor front card. And, uh, yeah, it's all there, 1915, as you can see. Uh, it's just neat to see. I, I don't know how it works or anything. I don't know if that was ever made. Or put into production, but yeah, that's that. So I don't know. Uh, I have a couple of. I have a folder of drawings and some three D stuff I've made. I don't know if. Uh, I can't see anybody, or I can't see Ben, so I don't know. Hi. Hi, I'm here. Yeah, you could take another like 10 or 15 minutes to show some of your work. And then... Okay. Um, oh, 530. Oh, it's yeah, it's okay. late. Then do some questions. Okay. Um, sure, okay. So these are, I just put a bunch of different drawings in here. I like doing these, uh, they're like, I made a bunch of these big pen drawings of hairy people or people with weird hairstyles, unique hairstyles. Um, that's, that actually rotates. I found an old motor and got that going and it lights up inside. Another big pen. Drawing. What was that tower made out of? Um, I don't know, I can't go back on my, oh, there. That tower? Yeah. Uh, it's wood. And the dragon heads are pewter. Um, yeah. So just is it a one of a kind? Or? It, yeah, it is. It's it's about it's about that tall. My friend bought it off me a while ago. I think it stopped working after a while. But yeah, that's the problem. With some of those old those things need maintenance. That's, it, a, it, that's a new profession, toy maintainer. <laughs> Somebody could do yeah. that for a living. God. Yeah, really. Uh, 
Yeah, I, I like thinking about just in line with toys and games, kind of like amusements or um, roadside attractions. So that's what the idea is here. Uh, kind of a toy related uh, jointed figure thing. I like the idea of finding treasure. So that's what that was about. A birthday card. Uh, that's, I'm trying to make the texture look like uh, wool or felt with pencil crayon. There's a Christmas card. Another big pen. Okay. Sorry, I didn't realize it was so late already. That's a wood block print. Toy team and house calls. So I just put this in here to show, this is the last slide, I think, just to show the kind of uh, computer castings I was doing. Uh, I've made very few zines, but I advertise these in the back. 
and only one person ever bought one. So that was kind of funny. Maybe they didn't think they were real. They actually. I, yeah, I think that that was part of it, probably. Yeah. So, do you have any other slides of your toys, of your objects? Sure, uh, I have some three D stuff. I just didn't know if we were, if it was getting too late or no. not. But... Just a quick take a look at them. Okay. Um. Some. trucks and are these also one of a kind or you can these, make a few of them uh these are one of a kind but these i i i produced through a i've been learning a 3d modeling program on the computer and that was my first uh model car made with, with that um, and is that cut out of out of what is that made out of is oh these are print no these are castings i made a mold of the model the model was cut on a cnc machine out of uh, polyurethane and then i made a two-part silicon mold like a high heat mold for pewter casting and other lead casting and um i have some other photos of that there's a clock a couple of clocks uh, injection molded wheels. That's the earlier, an earlier version. Uh, these are tiny plastic digging figures. This is uh, one of my earlier engraving, like manual engraving machines, three dimensional engraver. So um, I would have to cut this out by hand, uh, make a line out cut basically, and use the, <clears throat> the, there's a stylus back here, and manually trace all this. And through this pantograph, it's set uh, to do a three, three to one reduction. You can move this arm and, and change it. Uh, anyway, I'm cutting into brass on this side. So I, I've done that a lot. I mean, it's I've done a lot more of that than I have computer cutting, but I'm I really love the precision of the computer stuff. So I'm uh, I'm continuing on learning that at least, seeing what I can do with it. That's a like a tiny pewter figure. Uh, weird figure for a card it's glued onto a card. I got really into uh, making stencils and, and trying to make these weird advertisements on flocked paper. So it's like baked German or something. I don't know. I just thought it was amusing office his I don't know what any of it means this I just try and make it sound funny uh, this is an injection molded pin I made for a, a guy who ran this general salvage whoops, shop nearby and um, it's quite small, actually. It's it's an inch and a half, but I uh, did a batch of those for him, and uh, I love <clears throat> doing the marbling and the color. It, it's enamel paint, so lots of different skin colors. I did a bunch of different uh, mermaids. Uh, this is another injection molded pin. Um, that's I ended up going the cheap way for mounting the bar pin on the back, just heating them on the on an element and then squishing them in in the back. I used to have, because I, I thought it doesn't really matter, it's the back. I used to have actual plastic posts 
there and I just melt the posts down onto it. But yeah, I didn't want to have to rework the mold for this one. Actually, it used to, this used to be a magnet die. So that round, that half circle there was where the magnet used to go. Uh, yeah. So I made a series of these local investigation pins and magnets, and I just made them and barely did anything with them. I, I just have a problem sometimes with getting stuff out there. Um, it's wood glued onto card. And these are pewter um, little uh, bar pin, or no, uh, tie tack backed pins. I just thought a lot of guns look ridiculous anyway, so I made this one look like a giant weird seaweed ball thing just as a joke. And, yeah, I don't think I ever sold any of those. Maybe one. Uh, that's a prototype for a dexterity puzzle. And that's an earlier version of these gourd heads that I was making. These are pewter ones. Uh, I don't really like what I did with the eyes here, but um, this is a sculpy model that, because uh, I decided I wanted to redo a better version of the pewter heads. And then uh, this is the resulting, these are plastic injection molded from the uh, aluminum die that I cut on that machine. <clears throat> This is one of the very first, I had an old popular mechanics or popular science magazine that had instructions on how to build your own uh, 3D pantograph like that other machine. But this is, is pretty precise, like that's the work it did. But, um, it, you know, it's, it just wasn't good for everything. It didn't have a moving table or, or any really solid way to clamp things down. So I'd have to move these tacks whenever I was going over that spot with the stylus. But that's just one of my very earliest attempts. Uh, more pewter castings. This is just from a, um, sometimes I'll just carve into a block of plaster, like uh, just, take a drawing and, and figure that out in reverse or just wing it and see. Because you can always remelt the pewter if it doesn't look great. Just carve a bit more and melt the pewter and pour again. Plaster is not ideal, of course, because it, it'll uh, flake away. That silicon rubber is one of the best things to use. Uh, but yeah, so these are some early just treasured chest tests. This is something I was working on for my friend Keith Jones. It's um, a sculpey again, and the it didn't cure properly. This that's the problem sometimes, especially here, like this time of year in Canada. Uh, this stuff isn't going to cure unless you're in a really unless you warm your room up and keep it that way for a week. So or maybe I didn't mix it properly. So this is, it still worked well enough, but that's why this uh, white liquid plastic has these weird marks in it. Anyway, um, so the brass die, it looks compared to CNC machine, it looks uh, crude, but it doesn't really matter in the end for these tiny things. You can see on the left, the, uh, an earlier level of engraving on the head and then the, the more 
uh, smooth version. So I just made these into tiny little flat backed figures for him. And that's just a bit of the process of, of cutting the lino block for the engraving machine. And um, pumpkin delivery. Uh, that's one of my very first molds just to show and uh, polyethylene, like I think I just cut up old milk jugs and stuff and I had some coloring powder and I love the marble effect, e effect even though they, they're pretty crude castings, I had to cut a lot of flashing off the sides of them. Uh, but those were for my old roommate. Jessica's movie, Space Mare. <laughs> Fun to sell those at the opening. And that's my very first injection mold ever um, uh, out of soapstone. I had no idea if it would work or not. Just fit the cavity with chips of plastic and melted it in the oven. Uh, rattle, these are some rattles I made and some sandblasted. I was really into sandblasting glass for a while, so I made these designs. It's supposed to be like a, a group of restaurants or something, Misty Squish and Squish's Mist, or a group of drinks at a restaurant, something like that. Um, yeah, these are spinning tops. I ended up engraving that face. I took the injection molded black plastic version and then I reduced it again and cut it into uh, three times into this, um, this brass mold. And yeah, that's all without computer. So I had to figure out a I mean, some things are easier to do on the computer and just way more difficult to do. So it happened to flow pretty well. Um, and that was packaging for that. Uh, it's just a weird face. Uh, this is a pewter sculpture, pewter and wood. It's called the enthusiasm of linked septuplets. But, um, as if they're all actually linked together. Uh, more pewter and pewter and wood stuff. Uh, this is another earlier injection molded weird figure thing. Just I, I don't know what to call it. It's just a strange, it's an experiment. Uh, that was my friend's shop in Toronto, Jonathan, Johnny P. Um, so the bottom left just shows the original model that was made out of wood, sculpty, paperboard, cardboard, and computer. And then uh, I had a lesson at a bronze casting place and they cast that for me but I also made these little plastic versions uh, this is something I did for someone I used to work with I just put it in here to show the marbling effect that I really I really really enjoy that just letting nature change do its own thing because you know, it, you don't know what it's going to turn out like often when you mix the colors like that. Uh, this is a first, an early test for my wingnut toys, just making a, like as if it's the front door of the toy shop. And that of course is using the, that CAD program and the little CNC machine. Yeah, so there's, it's an old program now. It's about 18 years old, the version I have. 
but I had to start somewhere and I'm, I really like it now that I'm starting to get a better handle on it. Yeah, so that's... That's great. I don't know if there are any questions or comments that you want to take. Uh, yeah, a so lot of I, these... I, oh, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, I, I went on. I had no idea it was getting so late. <laughs> that's okay. But um, some of these toys, there was this category of toy. I, I used to talk to these old toy store people in New York, and they'd say, oh, well, that's a slum toy. They were toys made specially geared for poor neighborhoods that were very inexpensive. And uh, but I mean, they could still make thousands. I don't know. I don't have a sense of the print run of some of those toys, but I think they must have been pretty big. I yeah, I wonder too. Which which uh, toys were considered slum toys? Well, these really cheap Japanese cars and things that cost like five cents. I mean, they were really inexpensive, you know, in the 50s and 60s. Oh, they're so, kind of like those penny toys? Yeah, a little bigger. Like, oh, okay. A little bigger, but very, very simple little toys, you know. Um, sure. Cars, uh, little airplanes. I don't know. Oh, anyway, but it's kind of strange that you're sort of in a world of um, toys. You know, you explain that toys became a, a, of interest to adults. And if you were making toys that little children wanted, then maybe you could it'd be a bigger audience. I, I don't know, but I know there is an audience for these kind of art toys, these uh, <laughs> sculptural toys. But, yeah. Uh, um, yeah, my problem is I like working so small right now that I guess there'd be a choking hazard with everything I'm... Oh, yeah, yeah, a lot of these things, the, the pewter, all the stuff is probably considered poisonous or something for children, right? Oh, well, the pewter I use at least is um, lead-free. Oh, okay. I think That's it's 98% tin and a bit of mm -hmm. copper and antimony. That's good. But um, I would like to work larger, that's for sure. You, you said you'd like to make um, a tin plate. Some tin oh, plate. I used to dream of it when I was involved in, uh, in heavily into toy, looking at toys. But, uh, and, I, and I thought about all the, the technical issues involved in stamping, printing, and then stamping tin, and it just seemed impossibly complicated yeah well i think on a small scale it, i mean or all small parts i mean you could you could do at home yeah i'm pretty sure well i, I sort but of not, rem not quickly though yeah no i just remained in 2d so i didn't have to okay. do that stuff but uh but they're amazing the uh Someone asked, what's the name of the store you made the pins for? Um, at the, to the store you said I didn't mention in uh, Toronto? We oh, oh, Weird Things? Was weird it? Things. Yeah, Weird Things. It's gone now. Um, my friend, Jonathan Peterson, he just moved back to Victoria from Toronto, so he closed shop. Now it's called Tutun, I think. Uh, it's um, a new art shop in Toronto. Yeah. Oh, it was General something, a shop oh. in Victoria. Oh, General Salvage, which oh. is also gone now. It was in Langford. Um, it was a great place to find old hardware, house hardware and stuff. Yeah, somebody mentioned Shackman's. B. Shackman was a uh, a kind of novelty toy wholesaler on Lower on Fifth Avenue, like in the teens. 
an old company and then they'd have uh, they'd have these reproduction tin toys and things. I I think yeah. I have a cast. Oh yeah, I do right here. Shackman. Yeah. That was a great store. I don't know if it exists in some virtual form. But yeah, uh, this is 1974, so yeah. I wonder if it's Oh, it, the store is not there, but some of these oh. things, you know, migrate to the to virtual stores, and they still exist. There was a whole district in the the twenty twenty eighth Street, like the novelty toy district, and you know, the toy district was twenty third Street, where all the big companies had their showrooms. But then in the the surrounding streets were these. Um, these wholesalers who sold novelties of all kinds. Of, all I kinds. wish I could have seen yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think I, I just took it for granted when it was there. But, uh, but well, you it, wrote the, the graphic novel about that, or about cheap novelties. Yeah, yeah, the cheap novelty district, right? That's yeah, cheap. those were just cheap, cheap merchandise. There's also that still kind of exists as an area in the, the um, like just below 34th Street with all of these importers of things from the Far East, you know, um, suitcases and wigs and I mean, everything, anything you can imagine, but just really cheap versions, you know, very affordable versions of all this stuff. That's oh. what I'm thinking of the cheap novelty. But they also had novelty items, you know. Yeah, there was a store, I remember, on, um, what was that, like on 15th Street, you know, where you could buy all kinds of things like that. And they were kind of quasi-wholesale. They weren't oh. really supposed to deal with the public, but... Uh, I wish I could have seen some of those places. Uh, yeah, they're probably pictures of them. You know, Lower Park Row in Manhattan, north of City Hall, was was a novelty district and, okay. and I, but, but you know this is like the early part of the 20th century and i've seen some photos of those stores so um you know just below between city hall and where chinatown is now it was this uh, the whole area doesn't exist it was it was sort of taken it was made into uh, a park and things but it, but anyway, there was, I mean, I guess it was, the question is, how do you make, you know, beautiful toys that are in sync with the public so that people want thousands of them, yeah. kind of a market for them. I mean, yeah, it's a market for stuff. I mean, if you go to a, you know, look around toy stores, you see all kinds of stuff still being made. Um, yeah. Um, so maybe yeah, I'm, yeah. oh, I'm trying to trying to figure that out, but I also uh, you're right. Like, if they're art toys, it's harder to. I mean, part of the appeal was that they were cheap and they were very yeah. affordable, like a comic book. They weren't like an art print or an art object. They, you know, you can make a <laughs> toy and sell it for a dollar. Well. So that's kind of, I guess the whole point of reproduction is to bring the cost down. Like if you make enough of them, yeah, the cost should come down. And then they're not, uh, yeah, they're not, they can still be artful and great things to look at, but they could be, um, you know, have an audience maybe beyond, um, you know, adult, Toy art, toy collectors, but I don't know what that audience is. So, but so I guess people are trying to figure that out. Well, I I just showed the other day. I showed my friend Keith Jones a because he's my oldest buddy. I mean, we met in grade three, and we always drew cars together and stuff. And um, he's always wanted to make toys. I showed him something I spent ten hours on, and he was like, "Oh wow, we should pump those out for five bucks." A a pop and so um it's i have to find a 
a balance there, like get a lot quicker at making things, that's for sure. To sell well, something for five or ten, five yeah. bucks. Well, I think, I, yeah, go to, ahead, sorry. Oh, I'd like to figure that out, yeah. Yeah, I think there's all of this um, digital milling and digital printing technology should help somehow. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep going that route and see where it takes yeah. me. The, it yeah, should. I mean, you know, there are people who want to make one of a kind things and sell them in galleries and there are people who want to make comic books and sell them you know i mean yeah. even fanzines sell a lot of them cheaply but uh yeah but i don't uh, know it's a complicated thing when you get into physical objects yeah yeah um i'm trying to I'm trying to figure it out I'm trying to yeah there's so much to think about um, I feel like I don't have enough space here in this rental place. The basement's just, I'm not complaining. I'm just saying I really need to figure out getting a work, a proper workshop, and then I can lay things out and get a lot quicker, like have a little mini factory. Uh, An assembly <laughs> line, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's... Hopefully that that's in the future. Yeah, I guess the the, the future of digital uh, 3D printing is that you just sell the uh, the mod, you know, the uh, file, and somebody just prints it at, in their home. Uh, right. And it's not a you don't have to even manufacture it until somebody wants it. But I don't know. But you yeah. know, the balance between all these old. Uh, the quality of these old manufacturing techniques and uh, the cost involved, I guess, is uh, is the issue. You know, I guess, yeah, labor. You know, after the war, when a lot of this stuff moved to the Far East, I mean, they were like um, cottage industries. Some of these companies, some of these little companies. Oh yeah. Yeah, no kidding. Or maybe, you know, Louis Marx put the order in and they made them. <laughs> maybe. Yeah, I did a story many years ago about the manufacturing of toy cigarettes in post-war oh. Japan. You know, these little toy cigarettes that had like fake ashes at the end. And when you blew them, oh. like talcum okay. powder came out. Yeah. A novelty item called a toy cigarette. And um, was it a comic story? Uh, it was a picture book, a little picture book. But I tried to imagine that whole cottage industry of people assembling these things by hand. Yeah. So, uh, I guess if labor is cheap enough, <laughs> all these things were possible for a while. Well, that Erzgebirge, that town uh, they still make i'm sure they use cnc machines now but wooden toys are still coming out of there and they're they still look bulky and yeah, uh, well painted you know uh, real expressions painted on faces and like yeah. the care is still put into them and so and yeah. and are they very expensive they're they're definitely um well yeah, maybe a little set of figures. It's not a kid's thing. Yeah, so I guess they're like 30 to 60 bucks or something. So people are paying more for the, the traditional kind of toys in some cases, I think. Right. Uh, yeah. Okay, I mean, that's well, an inspiration anyway. Yeah, yeah, there were, if you, that there is such a company is kind of amazing. Yeah, the uh, the whole uh, idea of um, novelty items, you know, giveaways, all the stuff those cat in those catalogs, things that were keychains and stuff like that. Uh, I mean, there's some still some need for these things. People still have hands and they have keys and they have things. Yeah, touch things. 
So uh, yeah, I, I like any kind of novelty, like like you know, just oh, bottle yeah. openers with figures on them, or like I've got a lot of that sort of stuff as inspiration, just sitting yeah. on. Yeah, there was there was a guy I knew who was constantly making little um, little like enamel and like met metal novelties. And he oh. would just sort of draw them up and bring them to a uh, an expediter somewhere in New York who would just send the order into uh, somewhere in the Far East and they'd come back, you know, a thousand of these little objects. Oh, that's cool. So maybe, yeah. So, I mean, he didn't make think about making them. He just knew there was a way to order these things. Okay. Some factory that could pump them out. Same with like the pins I'm making. I know I could easily go to China and get a thousand of them done for a fraction of the yeah. cost. But well, I, I don't know. It's partly a, a passion yeah. that I have for just the processes. Um, yeah, yeah, the process. yeah. But, uh, just the object. But I mean, and uh, somebody has to. I mean, why pawn off this cheap labor on somebody else? <laughs> you can do it yourself. You can serve as your own cheap labor source. Yeah. If you're a picture. If you're a some kind of. Uh, well, here's. I'll show you one. This is a figure I'm working on now. It says, thanks for visiting. I don't know if it's focusing or yeah, not. Yeah, pull it out a little bit more. Pull it away. Yeah. Uh, is it? Yeah, that's good. And thanks say for, something. So you're thanks. Good. Oh, it says, thanks for visiting wherever you went. So it's a general souvenir kind of oh, that's funny. Computer, computer guy. Oh, yeah, the souvenir business was gigantic. Phenomenal. Yeah. Every place in the world had, if not a postcard, they had all kinds of other little souvenirs. Yeah. So there were these people who like traveled around selling a town on ordering postcards, you know, and they'd shoot the postcards. So maybe that's make souvenirs for every little town in America <laughs> and get the Board of uh, Chamber of Commerce to commission all these little objects. Wow, like that. that would be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Famous buildings of each yeah. city or something. Yeah, the building, right, like the famous building. Yeah. That's wild. Oh. <laughs> but uh, there's a million business schemes waiting to be hatched. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Anyway, so thank you. That was great. Oh, well, great. Fascinating. Thank you very much, Ben. And uh, everyone can get it, find you at Wing Nut Toys, right? On Instagram. Uh, I know you have an Instagram. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's, I don't have a, the website up yet or anything but yeah uh on instagram sure okay i'll put that up on the, the video so people can look at it. okay okay so well, thank, thank you have a great day thanks you too ben and we'll, well see. talk to you in the future. talk yeah. about toys yeah take care <laughs> okay. good night bye-bye good night see you